happy to see so many people here. Artists, curators, museum people, uh, editors, collectors, and lovers of sculpture. I think that's so special about Sculpture Network that you create a circle around the artists and that we can support making art, which is not easy to have it as a profession. I know from experience. Uh, I give a very, hopefully, short introduction because we're already running out of time. <laughs> um, but um, I was asked to, do, uh, to give a short uh, framework uh, about this theme. I work as an uh, art critic and curator uh, for a long time, almost 30 years, I can't believe it. And then you see things change. And when I started, land art was happening. Uh, and in the meantime, it changed into eco-art and bio-art. And that's not something uh, what happens coincidentally. As for me, art is not something luxurious uh, to decorate your homes. Art is essential. Art is a human activity. And therefore, we as humans use art to reflect on life. I was strongly um, impressed by this book, Ton de Mer, Philosophy of Landscape. It's from 1970, it's a cultural anthropologist, and he has written a lot about our nature and um, art. And his theory is also the way we depict nature reveals how we relate to it. And nature, I mean, we can talk a long time about what nature is, Clive will do so, but uh, to make it simple, nature was threatening to man for a long time. And you can see that in the paintings. That's Ton de Mer example, for example, um, a 15th century landscape and a 17th century landscape. Just look at the horizon. Here, you cannot look away. Here, you have an open view. It has everything to do with the many changes that occurred in the position man thought he had in the world. I won't talk too long to it, but this was a God-centered universe when people were afraid of nature. They couldn't have the, um, the capacity to look out. It was threatening out there. And here people have traveled over the world. They have a more scientifically based view and then they, have more, uh, they feel more familiar with the world. Then in the 70s this happened. Robert Smithson in Emmen, part of uh, Sonsbeek, um, op Los uh, uh, And um, it was uh, made in Drenthe in 1971. And here you can see you don't depict nature on canvas, but you use the material of nature itself. With a shovel, it took ages to transport all this sand and it was not meant to be to endure. Interestingly enough, one of the people here, raise your hand, is from Land Art Contemporary and uh, she is in charge about how to keep this thing preserved. Very interesting discussion. They just renovated it in 2012, so we can still see it. But that was not actually what Smith Smithson worried about. Anyway, from land it came to substance of nature, earth, plants, trees, but also animals, as we can see here behind us. Uh, butterflies, cows, bees, and living organisms, and even genes nowadays in the bio-art. So artists use this physical material, they interact with the physical nature, with their own bodies. And that says something too, especially in our digital age, when we are estranged from nature. So when I see this of Niels Udo, who's sitting here and who will speak during the day, and you see this performance of Tim Ulrichs hiding in a stone, you can feel, when I see this, it has something to tell me how we are looking for actually where we come from, and do we still know? So, our relation during the ages has changed fundamentally, and you can see it, it shows with the art. Alain Sonfist, in 1975 already, envisioned a forest in the midst of New York. There was a plot of land which was not used, and he thought, 
he longed for the nature. And he thought, I want to have the plants there that were there before Na New York became a stone desert. So bring actually the city back to its original, before it was a city. And that, with that, he'll tell today about this special thing he fought for 10 years to get it that far. He may realize time, time landscape, so how was landscape originally? And um, he was booked as the first eco-artist. So that goes further than land art. Land art is more or less also an experimental avant-garde attitude. And slowly on you see that there is a deliberate message in there. And you can see this as well with Agnes de Nes in Manhattan raising crops in a time of urbanization. And now in 2007, very interesting, the urbanization has spread to Asia. And there they have reenacted in a way the Agnes de Nes with the rice field. All this is not coming from the air. Exactly at the same time when all these land art occurred and the beginning of eco art, you had the report of Rome, 1972, the limits of growth. Consumer society took shape. The population has increased. Here you see the figures. They actually predicted that the global pollution would in the end lead to a crackdown around 2030. Alas, the figures have proved to be true so far. And it's not a very pleasant idea. So we, as humans, are so numerous and uh, we have such an uh, impact on the world that Paul Crutzen, a chemist who won a Nobel Prize for ozone uh, studies and research, that he dubbed this era as a geological era, the Anthropocene, from Anthropos, human. And he actually is not very optimistic. He says Homo sapiens may threaten himself. Nature will continue forever, but what will happen to us? Fortunately, there have been some hopeful signs. I was really touched when at a climate change stop in Paris, uh, the countries in the world agreed on uh, CO2 emissions to keep them under 2%, and even people cried, the negotiators, because they were so happy. Now we have to live up to make it happen, and in a way it's also everybody's responsibility. The human impact on nature shows in art, this is of Reinier Lagendijk, this is an eco-artist, Ballanger, who goes with groups to the river to catch small fish and show, enlarge, the pollution effects into the deformed, the deformed frogs. <coughs> we have Koen van Mechelen, who pleads for biological diversity. He is here and he will speak. The other side is one way we're polluting. On the other side, we seem to master life nowadays. It's been a fantastic uh, achievement that we have been able to chart the human genome in uh, 2000, what was it, three. But we rule nature. We're playing for God. What will happen? You can see this discussion back in the arts. This is bioart. So at the same time this happens, even before the human genome was charted, Eduardo Gack coined the word bioart. And he made it known that he had crossbred a rabbit with the genes of a jellyfish and that it would be a rabbit that could li give light. So that's the other side of the coin. Art reveals nature. How we deal with nature. That's it. I think uh, eco and bio artists create awareness and hope in a time when the environment is under pressure. You cannot hear it there. Oh, okay. Good. This is the last slide. I love this one. <laughs> uh, this is of Jeff Vaas, one of the artists we'll see here. He will be here. Maybe he's already here. Are you there, Jeff? I don't see a raised hand. 
but he will be part of the tour. And I love this piece. Here he made a, a structure in plaster and he cooperates on an equal terms with animals, in this case bees. And the fantastic thing is that Geert Verbeke then offers a platform for artists to do this kind of thing, which you won't see in a museum. And that's really the interesting thing of this whole art that we will see today. It's not the kind of art you see in a white cube. And therefore it's really special that here Geert Verbeke offers this platform. So enjoy, we'll have a tour in the afternoon, you get to see it. I'm happy to introduce the next speaker, which is Clive Adams. I'm really honored that you come here. He is somebody since 1975 observing the art world, promoting the careers of people like Goldsworthy uh, and uh, Jan Davids amongst others. But um, he also is founded the CCNHW, the Con Center for Contemporary Art and Nature. Am I saying it right? Well, you may repeat it because I always get this kind of tongue twist. <laughs> But uh, it's uh, uh, in Britain, they have residencies and they deal with, let's say broadly, green art. Uh, the recently it has been soil art, where artists work with. But he'll tell uh, um, the outline of the development of land art, eco art and bio art. Thank you.